to humans. Wake up, wise up, do what you can, individually and together. Welcome to the Earth to Humans podcast. I spent the past three weeks in Ireland, exploring the breathtaking landscapes, learning about their amazing culture, and listening to some incredible music, a recording of which you'll be able to hear in the background. My ancestry traces back to Ireland, and learning about the folklore that would have shaped the way that my great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, and all of the Mulvanis before them would have related to nature and the places around them has been so special. I wanted to delve into this more and having seen a name repeatedly pop up on the resources I was reading, I reached out to Barbara Naline to see if she would be happy to speak to me. Something that really struck me about speaking to Barbara is her constant reference to folklore being a shared history, not just within a locality, but of the human species as a whole. Localities may have their own manifestations and translations, but all follow similar themes, many of which we will cover in this episode. Folklore is so important for so many reasons, including helping us humans to understand our connection with the earth and nature. Feeling and valuing this connection is crucial for human beings actually wanting to protect and preserve the nature that we have left and to understand exactly what it means to be a member of our species. I think what we always start the episodes with and it's good for our listeners to know is for you to introduce yourself if that's okay and tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure absolutely Hannah my name is Barbara Neelin or Neeline depending on which dialect of the Irish language you speak and that is actually the Irish form of the English surname O'Flynn but uh, in any case I teach in University College Dublin and I teach in the uh, the area of folklore and ethnology and uh, I've been teaching there for a, a very long time at this stage. We won't say exactly how long, but before I actually started kind of uh, moving into the whole academic area, I suppose, strictly speaking, I also worked for many years uh, in the, the archives of the National Folklore Collection, which is a, you know, an institution that's very, very closely associated with the teaching of folklore in UCD. And um, an awful lot of my work continues to be very much kind of grounded in the archive and related to the archive. So, yeah, I've been teaching uh, folklore um, full time for about the last, I suppose, 15 or 20 years now. And uh, but as I say, uh, what I teach for me is, is very much, you know, it has to be kind of relevant to, uh, I suppose, what what's going on in the world around us and indeed to my own experience. And the, the type of material I would teach would be very much based on the information that has been recorded in the archives of the National Folklore Commission uh, over the last, oh my gosh, how long would it be now? 80 years, I suppose. And the National Folklore Collection, as we have it in UCD, is actually one of the biggest archives, one of the biggest collections of its kind in the world. And, you know, it's not kind of a, an exercise in chest beating to say that. Uh, that, that is simply, um, it, it, it is, that that's quite true. And it's something that is acknowledged uh, internationally as well. So just for people that aren't aware of what folklore actually is, could you just give us a bit of a description of that as a term? Of course, and the word folklore in the English language is a relatively common term. And it's one that I think for my money, it, it has kind of unfortunate connotations, I think, and unfortunate associations in some respects, because very often when people hear the word folklore, they think of something that can be rather twee and folksy and that is very much associated with and relegated to the past. And they would very often think of something that has to do with old ways and old customs and old practices and God knows what. And I think that's very unfortunate because certainly for me and I know for my colleagues working in UCD and elsewhere in the area of folklore as well, folklore is something that has a real and a continuing relevance and a really kind of a sharp edge in terms of helping us to understand the world we live in today 
and um, you know our relationship with with uh, all kinds of aspects of our environment as well. In fact, um, I do a first year uh, module with students every September, and one of the definitions of folklore that I use in that module is the idea of folklore as being the historic relationship between humankind and its environment. And that is a kind of a very broad definition of folklore, but that is, I think, relatively accurate. Just to continue on that line of thought for a moment, I think what people very often think of when they hear the word folklore, uh, you know, I'd often ask students, you know, what, what does folklore mean to you? And the most common response I would probably get is storytelling. And, and storytelling is actually a very important part of folklore. But there's an awful lot more to folklore than just storytelling. There are all kinds of other aspects to the subject as well, including material culture, those tangible aspects of our heritage and culture and tradition, and including things like social tradition, which would cover areas like calendar observances and indeed um, ethno-medicinal matters of one kind or another, and also things like the rites of passage. And then, of course, you have the whole area of music and song and dance, which is kind of a, an area of study of its own within the uh, whole field of folklore. And then, of course, you also have getting back to people's, you know, um, very common perception of what folklore is. You have the whole area of verbal tradition, storytelling, whether uh, storytelling means international folk tales or local legends or whatever it might be. Of course, storytelling is very much a part of, of folklore as well. But the word, I say, has, has some kind of negative connotations. The only difficulty here is that I must admit that it's difficult to come up with another term or another word that accurately encapsulates what, what the subject is about. Popular tradition is probably a term I would prefer, but popular tradition is, um, you know, again, it probably would be a little bit unclear to a lot of people. So it's not ideal either, but I think it's probably better than the term folklore. I, I should say as well that the Irish word for folklore is actually Bailadus, as you, 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 you probably know, Hannah. And that actually translates um, literally as oral education, which is, in fact, a much more accurate reflection of what folklore is about. There are a couple of definitions of folklore which are perhaps a little bit cliched, but like an awful lot of cliches, they have some truth in them as well. For example, the whole idea of folklore as being the history that never got into the history books is one definition of folklore, which is kind of pretty true in many ways. Uh, folklore tends to be what we learn outside of school, outside of the official educational system and outside of official sources. So it has this kind of almost uh, subterranean or a, a kind of a, a popular quality to it, obviously. I mean, it's essentially unofficial in its nature. And, uh, you know, as we all know, what we tend to learn at school or in most areas of the educational system uh, as history tends to be the stories and the, the doings and the goings on and so on of the, uh, the the great men and they usually are men and the great events and what happened on the battlefields and in the parliaments of Europe. But folklore is unique in taking very much a kind of a grassroots up view of history and culture. So in that sense, you could describe folklore as representing a more egalitarian and a more democratic approach to human history and human culture. And that kind of sums up, I suppose, what the subject is all about and what its focus is. I think I've always thought of folklore as mainly storytelling and never really considered the material or intangible aspects of it. So I'm really excited to hear more about all of those. But I wonder if we can start with the very basic understanding of the stories before we move on to these other pillars of Irish folklore. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, many of the, uh, the, 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 the classic, I suppose, cycle of stories within the Irish oral narrative tradition would be the stories about Fionn McCool and the Fianna. And this is a cycle of stories which told of the exploits and adventures, as I'm sure you know, of this group of hero warriors who lived on the edge of society, essentially. They were young men, and this appears to have been, and indeed may well have been in practice, something of a kind of a, a, a rite of passage, to mention something I mentioned a moment ago, in, in terms of their kind of achieving ad adulthood and being recognised as, as adults. But in any case, stories Stories about Fionn McCool and the Fianna, as I said, there may be a kind of a, a grain of historical truth there as well, but they tend to focus on the exploits and the adventures of Fionn McCool, who was the leader of this band of warriors. 
And uh, and of course, we have counterparts for the idea of there being this leader of a band of warriors and heroes in other cultures and other countries, not least in other parts of these islands as well. It's a common kind of a trope that you find internationally in many cultures. But anyway, the form that this trope, that this idea took in the Irish tradition was to focus on Fionn McCool and his band of men, the Fianna. And the stories tend to focus on the um, the adventures and the um, the challenges that this um, group of warriors faced as they kind of travelled about Ireland and they seem to spend a great deal of their time travelling and hunting and um, getting into confrontations with various people who could be read as um, appearing to threaten the sovereignty of Ireland and so on. But anyway, this is a group of stories that is shared, it should be said, with the Scottish Gaelic tradition. So, I mean, the stories are not unique to the island of Ireland. They do belong to the Gaelic tradition, which, of course, is shared between Ireland and the Gaelic parts of Scotland. But many of these stories actually involve um, features of the landscape of one kind or another, where that, whether that be mountains, lakes, uh, or whatever it might be, hills of various kinds. So many of these stories are specifically rooted in the landscape. So in that sense, you could see that in this way, that uh, this aspect of the narrative tradition kind of adds a whole other layer of meaning and significance to the landscape and to features of the landscape. And um, it, it kind of, I, I suppose you could say, kind of imbues the landscape with this other layer of cultural significance for the communities who told and who heard these stories. But uh, but anyway, that's in the realm of, of international folk tales. But as well as that, when we come to look at local legends, now folk tales about Fionn McCool and Fianna and international folk tales tended on the whole not to be believed by people which I think doesn't necessarily take away from the significance of many of those stories, certainly in the case of the Fenian stories being associated with specific landmarks. But on the other hand, local legends by and large were believed in to a greater or lesser extent by at least some of the people in any given community. And many of these local legends also involve aspects of the landscape aspects of the physical environment and aspects of the physical surroundings of the communities in which those legends were told. And this, of course, is very interesting, too, because, uh, again, the legends can 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 thus be seen as um, adding this whole other layer, as I mentioned a moment ago, of significance and meaning to a, a landscape which to the uninitiated stranger might appear even quite uninteresting or to have no particular importance. But if you know the narratives and stories associated with particular places in the landscape, quite simply it acquires a life of its own in a way that I think is very important and in a way that shouldn't be underestimated when we come to look at the relationship between communities and their environment. And obviously there is an element of these stories that touches on the supernatural and on supernatural beings that people were historically either afraid of or could have some kind of impact on their existence within that landscape. There was a very, very strong tradition of a belief in the other world of the fairies in Ireland and indeed as with so many other aspects of Irish folklore, what we have here is really an Irish manifestation or articulation of something that you found internationally. So again, you know, something I'm fond of saying to students as well is that in, in one way you could say that there is no such thing as Irish folklore, far from being a kind of a narrow nationalistic body of beliefs or traditions that are absolutely unique to Irish people. No, I mean, that is not the case. There is virtually no story, no tradition, no belief, even any, no legend for which you won't find counterparts in other parts of these islands or Europe or other parts of the world as well. And that certainly applies to belief in the other world of the fairies. You could describe the fairies as representing a kind of a parallel universe. And it should be said probably as well that, that fairies in Irish popular tradition, they were so far removed from the kind of gossamer winged tiny little creatures that we have um, been led to imagine as fairies. And these little gossamer winged rather sweet creatures are very much the um, product of illustrations, Victorian illustrations of uh, children's books and so on and they really are very very different to the reality of fairies as they were talked about and as they were believed in in the actual authentic tradition so in a uh, genuine oral tradition fairies were um, most often said to be you know pretty much like ourselves not just in appearance but also in the way that they went about their lives you know in their livelihoods they were believed to own livestock they were believed to farm they were believed to have families have children and so on they were believed to uh, have social lives of their own to have parties and festivals 
festive occasions and so on. But the kind of one of the most salient features, I suppose, about this other world of the fairies is that, of course, it was invisible to us most of the time. And I think what you said a moment ago, Hannah, uh, very much touches on a kind of a central aspect of belief in the fairies in Irish tradition. When you spoke about the fact that th there was absolutely this disrespect to put it mildly for the fairies, which seems to really um, be found, you know, it's kind of a universal aspect um, of uh, pretty much universal of belief in the fairies, that people treated the fairies with a degree of caution. And of course, this also, you know, brings us to the idea that because the fairies were believed to live in the surrounding landscape and they were very often associated with particular features of the landscape, like archaeological monuments, for example, they were also very often associated with a kind of more marginalised, wilder part of the environment or landscape. But in other words, the many stories that you got about the fairies, both malign and benign, what, what it kind of boiled down to was the idea that there was this other force, there was this other dimension out there, and that that dimension needed to be taken into account and needed to be respected in whatever human beings were getting on with in their lives. So in other words, you had in a, in a kind of, you know, a somewhat oblique way, because this is the way that folk tradition and oral tradition tends to work as well. Instead of people going around a place in the past or in the recent present kind of saying to each other, oh, there is this other force in the landscape that we need to be careful about, you know, that, that, that would probably be even less effective in getting the message across. This kind of attitude to the landscape and to the environment appears to have kind of crystallized in this body of belief and tradition about the fairies. So that in other words, the landscape you know, is not ours to do with as we please, that we have to be cognizant of the fact that there is this other dimension, this other race of beings, if you want to put it out there, uh, who are also in the landscape, who also make use of the landscape and whose rights and interests need to be respected. Now, I don't mean to overstate that argument or to overstate the case, because I suppose you could easily do that. But I think it's an inescapable aspect of belief in the other world of the fairies as well. And it's something, I mean, this isn't my original idea. It's something that other folklorists and other people who have studied this material would, um, you know, they, they've written about this as well. There's a, a, a folklorist in Newfoundland in, in Canada, obviously, called Barbara Rieti, who has done fascinating work on belief in the fairies in uh, Newfoundland. And indeed, other people as well have kind of written about this idea of the fairies as representing that which is is wild in the landscape and also this whole idea of the necessity for kind of respecting the landscape because of the fact that it's meant to be inhabited by these um this other world and these creatures but you know the, the net effect of that is that no you can't just go out and do what you want to you have to take their interests into account as well in our previous conversation as well, you actually mentioned that there is a fear of punishment by risking doing things that displease the fairies, that there would almost be consequences of those actions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, indeed. Um, and this is something that you still find. I mean, what you find into the present day, into the 21st century in Ireland, I mean, you know, it, it's a... Uh, People, obviously, as you would know yourself, Hannah, people I don't, don't, I mean, for the most part, they certainly overwhelmingly don't actively believe in, in fairies anymore. Mind you, having said that, as has been argued again by a, a folklorist like Peter Narvaez and other folklore, the fairies have been replaced by extraterrestrials, UFOs, sightings of aliens and so on. Many of the stories about whom are actually quite similar in their content. You know, if you're talking about abductions or the fact that they're living among us, but we can't really see them all the time and the kind of activities that they engage in. You know, there are striking and very interesting similarities between contemporary beliefs about extraterrestrials and older beliefs about the fairies. And there's a definite, you know, parallelism between the two. But in any case, um, yeah, certainly the whole idea of uh, not wanting to offend the uh, the Dini Biaga, the, the, the little people, and even the idea of the way that people would talk about them is interesting because normally they were talked about in euphemistic terms. So it was probably um, most common that people would not talk about the fairies, but would talk about the little people or Ushland, the noble people of the hills or whatever it might be. So there was even a reluctance, the, the attitude of caution to the fairies even extended to a reluctance to actually say their name out loud. But certainly there was a reluctance and um, a very great 
great uh, disinclination to offend them in any way. And this, as I was starting to say, is manifested right into the 21st century in some of the more passive beliefs about the fairies, which continue to exist right up into the present and which most of us, indeed, including myself, would share. And what I'm really talking about here is a continuing reluctance to interfere with places that were traditionally said to be associated with the fairies in some shape or form. And there are many people today who would not actively believe in the fairies, but at the same time, as I say, but very much include myself in this, if you were given the option of interfering with somewhere that was traditionally associated with the fairies, well, do you know what? You kind of prefer to be safe than sorry, and life can be dangerous and hazardous enough, so let's just not. So it's that kind of passive belief which many people would share. But that belief also uh, has been responsible for the uh, preservation of many of our archaeological monuments and certainly many of the tens of thousands, and there are tens of thousands, of ring forts or early farmsteads that dot the island of Ireland. You will still find stories today of people who are said to have interfered with ring forts in some way, either by ploughing a ring fort or maybe by breaking down or uh, again um, damaging in some way some of the surrounding earthen walls, which you very often find as, as part of ring, ring forts, and who paid the price in terms of misfortune of one kind or another, personal loss, personal injury, or whatever it might be, which of course served to re reinforce the belief that it's better not to, better to leave these places alone. So uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that kind of attitude to, to the fairies was very common. Um, just talking about attitudes to the fairies as well, and I know that this is something we spoke about earlier too, the whole idea of the fairies uh, nowadays in kind of contemporary 21st century culture being perceived as a very benign kind of a, a harmless force, I suppose, out there. Uh, th this is quite at odds with, with many aspects of traditions about the fairies. And it should be mentioned that you, 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 you certainly did very much have a darker side of fairy belief as well. And this is described quite brilliantly by Angela Burke in her description uh, in her book on the burning of Bridget Cleary, which describes how an unfortunate woman in the uh, 1890s in County Tipperary was actually ended up being killed by her family because they believed that the real person had been taken by the fairies and they were using traditional methods in order to try to scare away the fairy changeling basically and get the real person back and that is you know that's just one of what probably almost undoubtedly were many instances of the same kind of thing happening. So, you know, I just feel it's important and only uh, fair and correct to acknowledge the darker side, this kind of underbelly of fairy belief, which also definitely existed as part of the tradition. And something that you've touched on with relation to fairies is this respect for landscape and respect for archaeological sites which feeds a little bit into modern conservation and environmentalism and when I first spoke to you about recording this podcast you sent me your upcoming paper which was about how folklore is feeding into environmentalism and obviously this aspect of folklore assists the environmental movement in a way in some areas of historical conservation but there's obviously a lot more to be said about how folklore is doing that and I just wondered if you could go into a bit more detail about other areas aside from the fear of the fairies and of what the repercussions of damaging these sites in any way could be. Yes, absolutely. And again, this is getting back to, uh, you know, the definition of folklore, which we spoke about at the beginning of this interview. And I was talking about the fact that folklore also involves many aspects of material culture, the kinds of occupations that people followed, the ways in which they worked the land, agricultural practices of one kind or another, the, the, the ways in which people constructed their houses, which brings us to the whole study of vernacular architecture, of course. So you have, I mean, I think on two levels, there is an increasing awareness of the fact that traditional modes of expression and also a traditional usages and practices of one kind or another are something which can be really, really helpful in terms of feeding into how we look at and manage environmental issues in the present day. And, and this is something that you find internationally. I mean, there's some very interesting work going on in 
this area drawing from traditional knowledge in parts of Africa and parts of, you know, um, Australia and in, in, in Europe and in Asia and other parts of the world as well. So it, there is this growing appreciation of the fact that folklore is not just a collection of kind of quaint and nice stories that, as I was saying earlier, relate totally to the past, but it has a real edge to it. And it has something that is of real use to us in the present day. Uh, in terms of material culture, um, and this is something we spoke about briefly earlier as well, you have the whole practice of, of wintering or winterage in the Burren, as it's called. And the Burren, of course, is this amazing area of limestone karst in the, the county in the west of Ireland in County Clare. And you have this um, this practice, which is uh, very much um, continuing into the present day, of people actually moving cattle to the upland areas of this limestone area for grazing purposes in the wintertime, which is ecologically in terms of the management of resources in that area and grazing resources and so on is actually a very, very, um, a, a very good and a very positive thing to do. And that's something that is absolutely authentically traditional, which is, as I say, continuing to the present day. But certainly in terms of, you know, things like building practices and so on, the use of more uh, environmentally friendly material, the use of more sustainable resources and so on, you know, the use of, 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 of thatch, for example, is something that has been looked at by some people too. All of these areas do present us with opportunities to learn about better ways of living with our environment and, and ways in which we can live more sustainably. And of course, that also applies to even areas like eco diversity, where you have organizations like Seed Savers, for example, uh, you know, looking at the archives of the National Folklore Collection, which I mentioned a moment ago, in order to try to learn about different varieties of crops and fruits and so on that were grown in the past. Uh, so there are all kinds of practical ways in which a study of folklore and popular tradition and traditional approaches to things can be a very real and practical help. And if I could just stick with um, vernacular architecture for a moment, which I, I just mentioned, uh, there's a, a wonderful man called Paul Oliver. He passed away a short time ago, unfortunately, but he was an architect himself who was based in Oxford. And he did, um, he, he would be very highly um, uh, regarded and very much recognized in the area of the study of vernacular architecture internationally. But Paul Oliver, in his many writings, and uh, he published a, a great deal on the subject, uh, including a, a wonderful book called Dwellings Throughout the World. And I would recommend this book for anybody who thinks they're not interested in the subject of vernacular architecture, because you couldn't look at this book and not be interested in, in this whole area. But anyway, he wrote about the use of the study of vernacular architecture in terms of trying to handle issues like the displacement of people in the present day, refugee problems, for example, examining how people actually used their living space in an attempt to construct solutions that are more satisfactory in terms of trying to look after their interests and engage in rehousing projects in the present time. Again, his study of vernacular architecture was very much kind of keyed into and clued into contemporary 21st century problems in terms of housing and how we house people and people's use of space and so on. The, the other area of the protection of, of historical monuments and so on that we were just talking about a moment ago, that I suppose is kind of in the more conceptual and symbolic and metaphorical realm. But having said that, you know, I think we ignore the importance of symbolism and metaphor at our own peril. And it's something that we very much need to put into the equation when we're talking about traditional approaches and what we might learn from folklore about pe people's approaches to the, the environment in general in the past. So you have this very practical dimension to the subject of folklore, and then you also have this much more conceptual dimension to the subject of folklore. But I would certainly argue that both areas of the subject in their own way can teach us a lot about how we might learn to interact more profitably uh, in, in terms of the long term and in terms of the greater good of all concerned uh, with the environment. The type of architecture that there is today and what things used to be like, the establishment of things like porches and hallways to go towards a kitchen where the kitchen used to be open to the community and open right at the front of the house. And it's quite significant with regards to how we behave within our culture today of being quite insular and being apart from a community, which in itself has environmental implications. 
Well, absolutely. I mean, the study of folklore is very, very much concerned uh, with the study of people's interaction with their environment. But that environment can be historical, it can be economic, it can be physical, but it can also be human, our human environment, how we relate to the community and other people in the community. And this is something that a very well-known folklorist, an American folklorist called Henry Glassy, who is Professor of Folklore in the University of Indiana in Bloomington. It's something that he has written about uh, in great detail. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the study of folklore brings us back to the whole idea of privacy as being a relatively modern in historical terms concept, something that kind of really started to develop, to develop after the medieval period. And you can see that in, in, in a kind of an older way of living, you quite simply had a more communal approach to living where you didn't have things as compartmentalized as we tend to have them in the present day, but there was a more open approach uh, for a start to members of the family. And, you know, you very often had an extended family living together in the in the one dwelling house, but equally well, individual families in turn were often very much more open to the community and to passers by and to the public at large. And equally well, the kind of very, very strict dividing lines that we take for granted in most contemporary, certainly most Western societies in the present time, that we have these kind of delineations between the animal world and the human world. I mean, that didn't really exist to the same extent in the past either. And we have evidence for this in the study of vernacular architecture, as you mentioned a moment ago, the type of house that was particularly common in the, the, the northwestern half of the country, if you want to put it like that, is known as a direct entry house by those who study vernacular architecture in Ireland, which meant that you had no division, you had no area dividing the internal space of the family, that the private space of the family from the outside area. You just had a door and the, the main doorway of the house simply opened up from the outside, from the public area, you know, right into the kitchen, which was, of course, the living area, the heart of the house. And this, again, has a symbolism that we shouldn't underestimate because it did reflect, as I say, a kind of a greater openness. Now, again, I think it's important to say at this point that, you know, having worked in this area for, for a long time, uh, nobody would want to romanticise or idealise the idea of communities in the past, which had a huge number of hardships and disadvantages of their own. But nonetheless, the fact that we have certainly moved in recent centuries from this more communal approach to living to a far more privatized and individualized approach to living. It's something that as a folklorist, I would argue and other folklorists, would argue, we should at least be aware of that this is something that we, you know, we, we have lost to a considerable extent. And just to be aware of that and to think that, well, you know, maybe what you do get with increasing individualization and privatization and so on can be, not in every case, obviously, but it can in, it result in feelings of increasing alienation, dislocation, people being removed from the community, which we all learned the importance of so much in the recent pandemic. And, you know, the idea, as in other areas of life in general, is probably to try to find a balance between those two. But the idea of increasing privatisation, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject. And again, not wanting to kind of, you know, go on too much about it, but even in my own experience growing up in Ireland, we say in the 1960s, and at that point, your bedroom in the ordinary house that we lived in in North Dublin is somewhere you went at night to go to sleep. And that's not the case anymore. Even with my own family, my own daughters, children's bedrooms have increasingly become their little living rooms, their living areas where very often their friends go. We also have so that that's an example of the way things are becoming increasingly privatized and compartmentalized. You would never have had that up to very recently in a traditional house, the whole family, for better or worse. And there were disadvantages, obviously. But, you know, the whole family would have been together in the living room or the kitchen. So even when I was growing up, if you got a phone call from somebody, a boyfriend, whatever, you know, you took the phone call in the living room. And everybody else was there as well. So there were disadvantages advantages but equally well there were advantages to this you know greater emphasis on kind of communal living broadly speaking and you see it in the present day you see that increasing even further with people sitting on public transport or being out for walks or runs with their headphones and they're listening to podcasts or whatever it might be but you know they are you know all the more they're kind of almost in this um, hermetically sealed little environment of their own and interacting less and less with their environment 
And I think it's also it's also interesting to consider that disconnection of us from nature and from the animal kingdom that you've mentioned with regards to vernacular architecture and how that's manifested in the modern day and looking at what our relationship was to the natural world at a certain point in our history versus what it is now um, and whether there's whether there is a part of that to play in our disconnect. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, equally well, the kind of direct entry house that I mentioned a moment ago, where you have, you know, direct entry, which is why it's called that, from the outside world into the, I mean, the, the diametric opposite of that are, are the gated communities that we find today, where you have to key in a code or ring somebody and they press a buzzer and then they let you in. Whereas in the past, and again, it's not a romanticization to say this, I mean, people who are travellers who are walking along the roads would call into the house of a blank stranger, completely uninvited for a drink of water or for something to eat. Or whatever it might and, and this, this did happen this and it happened in places other than ireland so now i'm not saying that you know that kind of completely open living it did come with its disadvantages not necessarily the ideal and equally well the gated communities uh, probably have some advantages of their own but you know it, it's just again to kind of have an awareness of the fact that this has been an increasing tendency in the way that we organize society and the way we organize our living space and the way that we organize our relationships with the community at large and presumably, you know, while neither might be absolutely ideal, presumably there is quite a lot we can learn from the older way of doing things, which we are in danger of losing today with our loss of a sense of community and so on. And I think I'm right in saying that this is kind of more or less what Henry Glassie, whom I also mentioned a moment ago, would argue as well. But, but getting back to what you were saying there, Hannah, about the, um, you know, the, the uh, kind of boundaries between the animal world and, and the human world. I mean, it certainly wouldn't have been unknown for uh, animals um, in, in some shape or form to have actually shared living space with their human family, so to speak, in the past. So, I mean, you would have had sometimes larger animals um, and, and, and quite large livestock actually kept in the same living area on occasions. You got this in parts of Scotland, you got this in other parts of Europe as well. But even up to quite recent times, I mean, you would have had things like, we say, hens who were kept to roost in the kitchen and so on. And sickly or small or weak newly born animals might have been taken into the kitchen area to be kept maybe in a box or whatever, as, or as I saw myself, not so very long ago being wheeled into the kitchen in a wheelbarrow and left beside the fire until they kind of recovered and dried out a little bit and they were then taken out again. But, you know, you couldn't really imagine doing that in your average gated community, not that you find gated communities in rural areas, but you know what I mean? There is this kind of, this uh, this this complete contradiction which would be involved there. But equally well in, in conceptual, I mean, getting away from the practical idea of people and animals not being as separated in the past as they, they tend to be for the most part nowadays, with the exception of domestic pets. But you also move into the more conceptual area. You also have stories that were told in many parts of Ireland and elsewhere about the, the kind of interactions that you would have had between certain types of animals and, and human beings. And I, I'm thinking now, especially of a subject on which I've done some work myself, which uh, are traditions about seals and uh, the enchanted nature of seals, which would be quite a common feature of belief and storytelling all along the west coast of Ireland and uh, and elsewhere. And some of these stories, what would be at the, the kernel of many of these stories would be the idea that seals had this, these human qualities, that they were actually enchanted people who could appear in sea like form or who could appear as human beings. And in many of these stories, we are told that, that seals had the power of speech, for example, and we are told also of quite a common story which tells of a marriage between a mortal um, man and either a seal woman or else a mermaid, who is obviously a supernatural creature as well, who actually embodies the whole idea of this kind of crossover and connection between human beings and the animal world in the broad sense of the term, in that a mermaid is obviously a creature who is actually half human and, and half fish. So here you have this actual personification of this overlap. But uh, in any case, there are many versions um, of a story which describes how a mortal man married a supernatural mermaid or seal woman. And they then went on to have children. And we are told in some instances that descendants of this union actually live in particular areas right up to the present day. This is a very commonly uh, held tradition, a very commonly known tradition about the Keneally family of Connemara and the west of Ireland, where, you know, it's said that the ultimate origin of the Keneallys is this union between this supernatural maritime creature, in this case, usually a mermaid, 
and human beings. But um, in, in the work I've done, and I've, I've written an article on this subject, and I have tried to make the argument that in many ways, stories like this exemplify in their own way the extremely close connection that, as we know, exists between humankind and the natural environment and the animal world and the whole, the, the, the very intimate relationships and interactions that actually exist between humankind and our natural environment and aspects of the animal world and the fact that the interdependence that exists there as well so you know i would make the point that stories like the story of the man who married the mermaid or the seal actually reflect in their own way a much more sophisticated understanding of that relationship between humankind and the natural environment than we find in many societies and cultures that would see themselves as being much more advanced and much more sophisticated than the traditional communities who produced these stories and who told these stories. So it's just getting back to the idea that I do believe that narratives like this have their own lessons to teach us, very often in their own very subtle and nuanced ways, which maybe make them all the more valuable in some ways, but that we would again, you know, ignore this body of tradition at our own peril. And I, I should say as well that there's a, a wonderful um, person who I'm sure you probably know of too, Hannah, a man called uh, Brendan Price, who founded the Irish Seal Sanctuary. And Brendan is somebody who is active in environmental matters in general, and certainly in areas relating to um, the animal world and our, our treatment of you know the, the natural environment and, and animals in particular, you know going right back to oh gosh let me see certainly I think the 1970s. So he was very much kind of a trailblazer and a pioneer in the field. But when the Irish Seal Sanctuary and Brendan Price first contacted me about the work I had done on seal traditions, I kind of thought that Brendan's a scientist, and I kind of thought that you know these traditions would really be of any. You might enjoy them as a bit of right light relief and amusement in passing. But instead of that, Brendan is one of the people who has been one of our strongest you know, advocates in terms of really appreciating the value of this kind of material in terms of increasing our understanding of the whole relationship between humankind and the natural world. I think there's a lot of work going on in so many different parts of the world, which is trying to tie in indigenous folklore and belief systems and knowledge into modern day science and those things complementing each other so wonderfully that it's creating a revolution in the world of science and conservation and environmentalism so it would be amazing to kind of look at how those things really tie together both now and in the future uh, we were just talking about the fact the very, very close relationship and indeed the interdependence between um, humankind and the natural world and also talking about the, um, the, the very close connections between people and humankind and uh, the world of the sea, quite simply, the whole maritime world. And this, I think, is reflected very, very much in the story of the, uh, the, the man, the mortal man who married the, the mermaid or the enchanted seal woman that we are all so intimately and intricately interlinked with each other. But there's also a saying which you find certainly in the Irish language and possibly in the English language in Irish tradition as well. And um, there are various versions of this, but it goes along the lines of Jershid Nachwil Rutherbe Eradalov Nachwil Afixur Sawariga. And that would translate as um, they say that there is nothing on earth which doesn't have its image in the sea. And what that means is that everything on land has a counterpart at sea. And I just think that's really interesting because, again, this does, you know, represent an important implicit acknowledgement on the part of collective tradition, if you want to put it like that, of the fact that there is this, this incredible richness of life, quite simply, uh, under the sea and, and in the sea and in a maritime context, which I think we've probably only, you know, begun, begun to really explore and to know about. I mean, it's often described as, as, as being one of the great frontiers of exploration and so on. And yet you have in this um, in this saying uh, in Irish tradition, you have a, you know, a clear acknowledgement of that, that there is this, again, parallel universe, this other world under the sea and this richness of life and richness of material. And there's actually another expression uh, which you find in the Irish language uh, as well. And this goes as follows that um, it's as asgan as an ishka a virtue on dinner. No, a machas an ishka virtue on dinner, to be quite precise about it, which means that people are born from 
the sea or the water rather but i mean again this would seem to suggest that all life obviously as we we, we yeah, as is generally taught nowadays originates at sea or in the water and uh, you know this does seem to be kind of a an acknowledgement again i'm not saying that people who would have said who would have used these sayings would actually have had any awareness at all necessarily of you know modern scientific thinking and all of this but it does seem that at some kind of a collective level, that there was some kind of an awareness or a consciousness, again, of this extremely close relationship between people and the sea and the whole maritime world. And that, I mean, it's, it's possibly and probably reading too much into it, but even the idea of all human life originating from the sea, I mean, that is what this saying says, that people are born, the person is born from the sea. So it, it's just, you know, again, probably wrong to attach too much significance to it, but it certainly is, at the very least, it's worthy of note and it is of interest. Uh, this also brings us to the very, very rich corpus of tradition that you find in Ireland, again, reflecting international traditions elsewhere too, that there are all of these submerged cities and islands and underwater worlds of one kind or another, which human beings are occasionally allowed to visit or are in a situation of visiting. So, you know, you have them. Um, Again, you have great stories told, for example, about fishermen out at sea who kind of uh, managed to dredge up household implements like uh, spinning wheels or in one wonderful case, which is just, you know, it's so kind of dramatic and the, the image is so great. Fishermen fishing off the West Coast one day in their fishing boat who had their, uh, their, their long lines cast and the next thing one of them hooked up a, a pot of potatoes on his his hook and on his fishing line and the potatoes were boiling and i think in this case it doesn't actually say presumably they just put them back again but you know it's such a gorgeous encapsulation and it's such a wonderful um illustration of the idea that you have all this this whole other world existing under the sea which of course there is but it is simply conceptualized in popular tradition in this in this form um in the form of uh, enchanted islands and other worlds and cities which were believed to exist under the sea but of course there are all kinds of enchanted islands and underworlds and, and cities actually there which we're only starting to discover about not exactly as they're described in the traditional stories but nonetheless you know the the the, the essential truth i suppose is um is there all of the time and there is also yeah it's, it's probably just worth mentioning as well and this is, is something i've done a little bit of work on myself the whole notion that this underwater other world was peopled by a whole range of, of supernatural creatures which could include supernatural beings like enchanted seals which we've spoken about or mermaids or indeed the souls and the spirits of those who had drowned at sea or indeed the fairies who actually lived at sea or all kinds of other supernatural enchanted salmon as well, all kinds of other supernatural beings who are believed to inhabit the realm of the sea. And there was a wonderful kind of an umbrella term that was used again in the Irish language for this this other world, which was Uishla Nafariga which actually translates as the noble people of the sea, which was kind of a blanket term that covered all of these inhabitants of this other sea world. But again, it's just it's just a very good idea of the fact that, you know, in the kind of 19th, 20th century with the advent of science, we kind of thought we knew it all. But in fact, there is so much we don't know, whereas popular tradition and folklore all along knew that we didn't know it all. And, you know, it knew that there is so much else out there that is still to be discovered. And these ideas are encapsulated in traditional sayings or stories or legends or narratives. And that, you know, for me, would be part of their importance in terms of looking at what they have to say about our relationship with the environment. I know that there are various different species of wild animals that feed into Irish folklore and are important and significant. But I know that there's also a lot of plant species as well, which I know that you lecture about that are both important with regards to stories and place, but also medicine. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's another kind of very obvious area, I suppose, where science and um, and, and tradition and folklore do have a, 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 an overlap and can be of kind of mutual benefit to each other. I do teach about folk medicine in UCD. And I think the important thing to realize about folk medicine is that, um, as one uh, medical sociologist has put it, folk medicine could be described as a kind of a social form of medicine. And this gets us back to the idea of the importance of community and the interaction between individuals and the community, because obviously nobody would take away for a moment from the, the miracles of modern science and modern 
medicine and what modern medicine can achieve and has achieved. I mean, that goes without saying. But at the same time, uh, many people, including myself, would argue that there are certainly aspects of folk medicine which I think we can probably learn from in terms of, you know, understanding how the whole process of healing works and the importance of community interaction and so on, the importance of what E.M. Forster, the great English novelist, would call connections, the idea of being connected, whether it's to the community or to the past or to the place you live in which, you know, is manifested in, 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 in terms of traditional healing practices very often in the form of holy wells, hundreds of which dot the countryside. So, you know, folk medicine can connect us in so many different ways and on so many different levels, but equally well, and again, going back to a kind of a more practical view of the subject, equally well, there are certainly many traditional remedies which were used in the past, which, you know, have, have proved very fruitful in terms of scientific investigation. And undoubtedly, there's a great potential out there as, uh, you know, as, 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 as many people, indeed many people coming from kind of a, a professional, conventional, official medical background would acknowledge the idea of investigating traditional cures of one kind or another, and especially herbal and plant cures, of which there are so many. I mean, almost undoubtedly, that is another area which has proved to be very fruitful in the, pla in the past. I mean, our, our discovery of, of aspirin, the discovery of digitalis and the foxglove plant and so on. These are two very high profile and obvious ways in which traditional medicine has helped the develop development of modern medicine. But as I say, I think there are kind of less tangible and more abstract ways in which a study of, of folk medicine can help us in our understanding of, of medicine at large. And this is something that Many, in my experience, many people who have received official medical training that, you know, they're, they're, they're very open to this idea. And I would suggest that there may even be kind of a, a greater openness now on the part of conventional um, medics uh, than there was maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And you can still understand, you still get people dismissing aspects of folk medicine as being, you know, ridiculous and of no kind of scientific or provable use, which is absolutely understandable. You can certainly understand why people would take that attitude. But I, I think that they are probably, you know, approaching the idea of folk medicine from not an entirely correct perspective, that it is essentially community based medicine and that it can teach us a lot about connections, as I just said, but equally well as well as that kind of more conceptual area, that there are certainly practical cures that we find in traditional medicine, again, in Ireland and elsewhere, that could prove and have proved to be of use in, in strictly scientific terms and that could benefit modern medicine. And obviously, as well, it's an argument for the conservation of natural places. Um, well, of course, absolutely. Yes, indeed, indeed. And again, getting back to the relationship between people, individuals, communities and their environment. In the past, you did have this very, very thorough and huge familiarity that people had with their natural environment in terms of not just the cures that particular plants or herbs might have, but very, very often you would have had all kinds of beliefs about the supernatural, stories, narratives of one kind or another uh, told about particular plants. So in other words, cures were just part of one kind of whole cultural matrix, which again represented the relationship, the very close relationship that existed between communities and their environment, which um, certainly hasn't disappeared today. But I, I think it's probably only fair and realistic to say that it probably has lessened considerably with the incursions of modern living and ways of life and so on. So people don't have that huge famili familiarity with their their natural environment that they must. And of course, it's an argument for the conservation of particular areas and particular habitats and so on. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Is there a specific plant species that has a massive amount of significance within Irish folklore? No, I mean, I think, again, it probably would be, given the nature of the subject, you can get a lot of fanciful, you know, conjecturing out there. The, the internet is full of this, and it's one of the occupational hazards of, of studying folklore, I suppose, is that there are a lot of unsubstantiated theories and so on out there. No, in effect, what you actually find in terms of, well, certainly in terms of traditional cures, is that the, the types of plants, such as the dandelion, various types of mallows, um, nettles, gosh, let me see, um, plantain, of course, as well, that the types of cures that were most commonly used for healing purposes in Irish tradition, you know, generally speaking, would be, wouldn't be would be a million miles removed from what you find, again, in, in other parts of these islands, in Britain and in other parts of Europe. Um, 
Having said that, there are certainly uh, types of plants that, that would have specific connections with the other world of the fairies. Um, ragwort, for example, would be one of those plants. It was believed that fairies on occasions could ride ragwort, that they could, sorry, could transform it into some kind of a, an equine cre creature of some kind and then ride around the place on ragwort. And foxgloves also were believed to have a particular connection with the other world of the fairies. But um, but these these beliefs were uh, they they were they were common enough, but they were by no means universal. And uh, certainly in healing terms, no, there was no one particular plant that would stand out as being unique to Irish tradition, shall we say? And with this resurgence, um, as you mentioned in the kind of mid twentieth century of interest in folklore, and within the modern day culture of Ireland what do you kind of see the future of folklore being within forming and shaping Irish culture oh gosh uh let me see um... <laughs> I know that's a big question <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is okay uh gosh I'm trying to think now um it, it's somebody whom I know I've quoted uh um, in, in, in one of my own articles, a, a Nordic folklorist, I think it, it is, who says that we simply cannot arrive at a full or a proper understanding of human culture without taking popular tradition into account. That, I mean, you know, we're talking about not high culture here, although I mean, high culture is wonderful in its own way, but we are talking, as I said before, about the stories, the legends, the beliefs and so on of ordinary people uh, throughout Ireland and the rest of the world. So I think that, you know, a, an increasing understanding of the importance of, as I also mentioned before this more, egalitarian and democratic and um, more, I suppose, um, perhaps more just approach towards the study of culture and history. I think we're, we're probably seeing an increase of that. I would hope myself, and this is kind of, I suppose, in a more political way, that an increasing appreciation of what exactly folklore is would also lead to an increasing realisation of the truly international nature of folklore and that far from folklore acting as ammunition for those who would adopt a more narrowly nationalistic approach to culture, that a study of folklore would actually make them realise, you know, that the oneness of mankind and the fact that this is a global phenomenon which is shared to a greater or lesser extent by all people. So the international nature of the subject, I think, in political terms, is something that I would very much like to see, you know, be, being focused on more. I mean, I always kind of tend to cringe a little bit if I get, you know, essays from well-intentioned first years who kind of write for me that Irish folklore is the best folklore in the world and Irish tradition is the most important tradition in the world. And I say, no, have you been listening? That is not what I was saying. That is the opposite of what we were saying in, in so many ways. And of course, there are many aspects of folklore that are specific to Ireland. But, you know, for the most part, the only way I think of really arriving at a productive understanding of it is to see these as Irish manifestations of international cultural phenomena, as I just said. So, uh, yeah, so that's that would be my own personal hope. And I, I actually do with the increase in, 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 you know, nationalist movements, which we're seeing to such a frightening degree all over the world at the moment I, I would very much hope that folklore would would feed into um a, a kind of an, an antidote towards that expansion and towards that growth that certainly is very much my understanding of folklore and it's not just me there are many other folklores in many parts of the world in in in, in scotland and in, again other parts of of britain and so on who would very much share that view of the subject so this isn't a particularly original or unique idea but it is one that given the as i, I said in, in, earlier on in the interview given the kind of connotations that folklore tends to have it's one that perhaps you know Know, needs emphasizing and should be you know kind of spelt out to people that it's not um it's not something wonderfully unique to Ireland it's an international a universal and I think the increasing nationalism and so-called patriotism is not only damaging to our shared human history but it's another incidence of this real disconnection of community on a global scale. So not only just within your own local community, but also a way to disconnect us from being a, a species who is in this together. And it's so damaging to the environmental movement, but also damaging to the future of human history. And oh, yeah. yeah, I think what you've said about folklore being sh a shared human history that 
there being all of these indi individual manifestations of it, but it being something that is on a global scale is a really great point and something that is so important. It, it's just, it's a, it should be seen as a shared resource and a, as a shared, you know, uh, source of information for going forward. And of course, you know, as we've also been saying, our individual relationship with the community and communities relationships with other communities, and then the relationship of humankind with the, I mean, these things are all tied up and connected up together, just as you say. But the importance of community, of course, that can be read on a global scale, as well as on a more regional or local scale. It's the same principle that's involved, absolutely. Something else I would like to know is what you think is one of the most obvious manifestations of Irish folklore in the modern day? There would be quite a number. I'm sure I'm probably going to think of something terribly obvious after this interview is over and be kicking myself for not having thought of it now. Uh, I suppose it's very hard to um, not mention. And again, this is something that sounds quite cliched, but it really is quite true. The occasion of Halloween, which is, you know, totally part and parcel of contemporary society at a global level and is apparently increasing all the time. And Halloween is something that would appear to have a background again, not necessarily just in Ireland, probably in England as well, but it very possibly was. Now, we've no definite proof of this, despite what people like to think and say, but it very possibly was uh, um, originally a Celtic occasion. And uh, what does seem to have happened then is that the idea of the calendar occasion of Halloween on the 31st of October, obviously, was then transported across the Atlantic to the United States and North America. And now it has been, you know, embraced, especially in recent years with open arms in American culture in general, and now aspects of Halloween traditions have interestingly started to be transported back the other way across the Atlantic. So, you know, Irish people used to carve turnips on the occasion of Halloween. Now we're all carving pumpkins because this is an Americanization. But like people again often throw up their hands in a horror at this kind of this is the way that popular culture naturally acts. I mean, this is the organic development of any living tradition. But I think the interesting part about Halloween is that, you know, you, you do find going back to early Irish literature, there's a text which uh, people who are, again, you know, very much experts in these matter, uh, matters, tells us goes back to the 10th century. So I mean, right back into the middle of the medieval period. It's a story which is found, um, which is called the story of Nera and the dead man. And it's actually situated in the archaeological complex of Rathcrohan, which is in County Roscommon, which was the seat of the kings of Connacht. But the idea, the story is situated on the occasion of Halloween. And we're told, you know, in the initial, the introductory sentences, to the story that was a night of great horror and it was really dark and the wind was howling and God knows what. So, you know, the kind of scene setting would be worthy of a Hollywood Halloween blockbuster movie nowadays. And what happens then is that the king, cutting a, a rather long story short, but the king dares his the, the, his the men in his court to go out and to tie a twig around the foot of a man who has been hanged the previous day. And one of the courtiers who's called Nira eventually uh, plucks up the courage to go out and do that. But when he's trying to tie the twig around the foot of the dead man, the dead man comes to life. And then the dead man said, you know, I was very thirsty when they hanged me yesterday. Now you have to bring me to a house for a drink. And the dead man ends up um, getting onto Nira's back and Nira has to carry him from one house to another until they eventually reach a house, which is actually so disorganised, which I always find rather an uncomfortable thought. But anyway, uh, which is so disorganised that Nira actually, or the dead man rather, manages to get his drink in the house. And having got his drink, he then spits into the faces of the inhabitants of the house who are all asleep and don't know this going on at all, and they all die. But anyway, it's just, sorry, the point I'm making here is that this basic, plot and the sheer macabre quality of this 10th century story would fit right into what we know of, you know, as Halloween in the present day. So again, it's just, I, I suppose the reason I'm picking on Halloween is because it is a remarkable example of an occasion which undoubtedly has very ancient roots in Irish tradition and which has succeeded, as folklore so often does, in adapting and reinventing itself and living quite comfortably and happily with, you know, advanced consumer capitalism in the 21st century. So it is, it's a very typical example of the way in which you think that aspects of folklore will be dead and gone, and then you suddenly find that they are actually, there are so many of them still continuing to surround us. I kind of feel inspired to go as that the one of the characters from that story is my next Halloween costume just to see if anyone guesses. 
Yeah, yeah, they, they, they probably won't. And it's not a terribly well known story. I mean, we talk about it in folklore classes, obviously. And that's only the beginning of the story. The tale actually goes on then to describe Nira's visit to the uh, the other world and the underworld. Um, and uh, as I say, it kind of the story overall bears a certain relationship to some oral folk tales that are found in popular tradition at a much later date. But that actual text goes back to the 10th century. So, you know, it really is. It just shows that plus a change and all the rest of it, you know, that so many elements and the whole atmosphere of the story is so similar to what we find in the present day in terms of Halloween observances. Huge thank you to today's guests for joining me and to Eilish O'Connor, Moira O'Keefe and the rest of the musicians at Tully's in Kinvara, County Galway for allowing me to record their beautiful music. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please rate us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and if you want more insight into our episodes, you can follow us on Instagram at Earth to Humans Pod.